All right. So for the weather usual update, I am in the south of France at the moment. It is gorgeous outside, 20 degrees. Um, let us know in the chat function if you can hear us um, loud and clear and what's the weather update on your side, where you're based, if you're doing well. Hi, John. Hi, Neve. Oh, Paris, really good. Dublin, Dublin. Hi, Claire. Good morning. Very good. From the UK as well. Great. So thank you, everyone, for joining. I see everyone coming in the room. That's great. So today, webinar is about health and well-being at work. I am Marina, Marketing and Brand Manager at Great Place to Work, and I'll be your host for today. And before we go into the webinar, I have some updates for you. So the first one is that we are having our Employer Branding Summit, the fifth edition on January the, the 31st. It will be held in person in the Epic Museum and the summit will start at 9 a.m. with breakfast and we'll have a full morning of content and it will finish at 1 p.m. with lunch. We are confirming the speakers at the moment, uh, but you can already book your early bird accesses and to thank our great place to work clients for the continuous partnership. We offer 50% discount on this event, uh, valid also on the early bird access. And if you're a great place to work client, you already have received your discount code by email. Then we have a few deadlines coming up by the end of the year. So we have Best Workplaces in Ireland and Best Workplaces for Women 2024. The deadline to be certified is the 15th of December for these recognition. And the service slots are being booked so quickly again this year. So hurry up if you haven't signed up with us or renewed already. And for the clients already renewed, you're automatically considered for these recognition if you reach certification. And lastly, um, if you are a Great Place to Work certified clients within the past 12 months, we invite you to join thousands of certified companies around the world on Wednesday, the 8th of November for Certification Nation Day. And Certification Nation Day is the biggest celebration of the year for our community of certified clients. And it's an all-day social media campaign celebrated across the world. So join us for that. So for today's webinar about health and well-being at work, we're joined by Michelle Dolan, Senior Well-being Consultant Manager, and Enda Campbell, Strategic Well-being Consultant at Irish Life, and Audrey Bleach, Engagement Manager at Cisco Ireland. And during this webinar, ask your question in the chat or Q&A function, and we'll try to cover as many as we can at the end of the session during 10-minute um, Q&A uh, time. And obviously we'll be sharing slides and recording of this webinar in the follow-up email. And before I introduce the first speaker, we will launch a quick poll to know where the audience is at with experiencing support and health and well-being in your organization. So we'll launch the quick poll now. Have you experienced support from your organization in regards to your health and well-being? I'll let you respond now. Okay, so we can close the poll and share results. Good. So you have experienced that a lot in your organization. So that's really good to hear. And um, you're here today to uh, hear a bit more about um, what you can do in addition of what you're already doing. So that's really good because we are welcoming our first speaker, who is Michelle Dolan, um, who, in addition to being senior well-being consultant, uh, manager at Irish Life is a chartered psychologist with uh, the Psychology Society of Ireland. She specializes in designing and delivering a range of mental health program for their corporate clients across various industries. Um, and she further manages a team of highly experienced psychologists and well-being consultants. Hey, Michelle, thank you for joining today. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Great. So thank you for joining, Michelle. And uh, you have a key mission today with us is, is really to update people on the key workplaces trends on health and well-being from Irish Life Research findings, and also to share insights on really how we can equip managers for them to support health and well-being at work and in their teams. Yeah, exactly. So do you want to go ahead? I will, yeah. Okay, so we might move on to the next slide, please. Yeah. 
Great. Okay. So today I will take you through some of the initiatives that we are rolling out successfully to our clients at Irish Life. We guide our clients away from reactionary one-off programs towards data-driven measurable programs. So what does that mean? What, what are the different types of data that we use? We look towards EAP trends, health insurance claims, what are our clients uh, claiming for? We look at um, internal data, employee voice surveys, pull surveys, attendant um, absenteeism trends, at, um, attrition and retention. We work with our stakeholders to understand the pain points that they have across their business. And then we start to look at designing uh, programs based on the data. Because it was World Mental Health Day on Tuesday, um, I might just mention our mental health assessment strategy plan. So we're working with clients to develop a mental health strategy for their businesses. We know this can be very much of a gray area. Some of our clients are early into the journey where they may not have too much in place, where other clients are much more mature. What we do is using our own IELTS Irish Life Diagnostic Tool, we're able to benchmark what the client is doing currently against the key components of what makes up a successful and effective mental health strategy. And from there, we're able to give a report back to our clients and set strategic priorities. So clients are given a roadmap of what to do aligned with what we know is effective and best practice. Uh, we'll move on to the next slide, please. So we find these, these um, initiatives really helpful for our clients. At Irish Life, what we do each year is we launch our own research. And uh, looking at the research from this year, we can focus in on some of the key workplace trends. This year, we found less than 35% of employees were comfortable speaking to their manager about mental health. Less again, only 30% believe their managers had the skills and tools to support mental health needs at work. We know that um, this is less, less people are comfortable speaking about addiction related issues, where we know that rates of addiction are on the increase, um, particularly across Ireland. And we know 32% of employees were fearful of, of negative repercussions if they were to open up and discuss their mental health needs. So what does this tell us? If we step back, it tells us that um, there's a perception out there that managers are not skilled to be able to support employees and that employees are not comfortable speaking up and that there's a lack of psychological safety in their workplace. So for us, we are really passionate about our people leaders. It's really important for us to make sure people leaders have the skills, have the tools, and also the confidence to be able to support these conversations and address and manage psychological safety. Uh, we know that our managers post pandemic are saying that their roles are more difficult. They're saying that what's making their role difficult is supporting sensitive conversations, managing confidentiality. So they are a group that need a lot of support and they are a crucial element to any mental health strategy. And we'll move to the next slide, please. So what we have done as a business is really invested in designing programs for people leaders. We have a program, uh, a coaching for managers and workplace mental health program that we have developed. It is accredited through the EMCC. The focus of this program is education, skills, training, and culture. So to give you an example, we want to educate our managers in what is workplace mental health? What are signs and symptoms of mental health issues? Because if we can identify the signs early, we can do something about it. We talk about an educator around what managers can say, cannot say. We want there to be positive communication, to be able to communicate concerns in a tangible, factual way, staying away from diagnostic language. We don't expect our uh, managers to be mental health experts or to fix problems. We focus on really clarifying and educating managers about their role and also the limitations to their role. It's important that our managers are able to understand professional boundaries and what it might look like if they're maybe overstepping or also understepping. 
for managers, it's important that they know that there's a duty of care to do something if they're concerned about an employee's mental health. So we educate on that duty of care and we bring in the whole field of reasonable accommodation measures and to be able to build those measures into a support plan for uh, employees. So this education piece has been really important. Uh, we recognize for our managers that obviously there's a bit of a skills deficit there, uh, which is perfectly fine. Uh, but what we want to do is really enhance the skills. Starting the conversation is often the most difficult part for a manager. And there's so much fear about actually approaching the employee. So what we do is we build in the skills such as um, communication skills, how you communicate, um, listening skills, empathy skills, how we assess what the person needs. Um, it might be around the, the role and um, it might be around assessing any impact at work, assessing if there's any workplace trigger. If there, if there is, well, then there's an onus on the manager to put some support in place. Um, being able to develop a plan for that person and to get that person to buy into their plan. So to collaborate and take personal responsibility for being a driver of their plan. It's important that managers have skills in dealing with an employee who might be upset, distressed, who might be angry, frustrated, defensive. Um, it's also important that managers can de-escalate these situations and then escalate any risk situation. Let's say someone might be at risk of self-harm if that was to come into play, or maybe um, they might need to look in with their own HR or our health on a case-by-case -case basis. So these are some of the skills that we give and equip our managers with. The next piece is around culture. We want to create a culture of coaching conversations. We want there to be openness. We want the um, managers to feel equipped to be able to uh, get the employee to collaborate in these plans. Uh, part of the culture is also about uh, policies and procedures. Uh, we know for some of our clients, they have mental health policies, others do not. Some are definitely further along the way in managing in putting process in place around managing disclosures and applying reasonable accommodation measures. But I suppose the driver for us is to develop a culture of early intervention and prevention as opposed to reaction. By doing that, we get to keep people at work, ideally. Um, or if they do go out sick, we get to support them back quicker. Um, an interesting statistic from our Health of the Nation finding research was that 40% of people um, agree that their colleagues are a source of support for them. So again, making sure that the supports there across teams. We ourselves run our own mental wellbeing allies program where they're trained up to support, to support peers, but to connect them into the right resources. So that's just a little piece on our culture. Um, Marina, it's never one and done. For us, no matter what we do, whether it's our manager programs or our well-being allied checking, our well-being allies program, we always make sure that there's governance and safeguards in place. So we have quarterly check-in programs where a manager might come and say, "I've had a difficult conversation; it didn't go great," or they might want to debrief on something with their peers in a peer-supported environment. They may want to, you know, look at skills. Um, and we might do a bit of a refresher, or it might be that we take those trends and go back to the business and say, this is what we're seeing, um, and we might try to build that into strategy. Uh, with the Mental Wellbeing Allies, uh, it, it's great and so important for them to, to connect in with their peers because it's absolutely daunting for somebody to be supporting other conversations without having those debrief groups and um, to be able to you know, have that support that they need. So that's a little bit on our manager program. And I just want to suppose with a slide mention, there was research recently that showed that managers can influence an employee's mental health up to 70%. That's more than a doctor, it's more than a therapist. So what we do as a manager or what we don't do has a real impact. So just to understand, that's really, you know, an important 
we it's an important job that we hold and it comes with lots of responsibility but it's make, making sure that managers are equipped for success okay i think you might move on please great okay so with this so what did this look like in action so what we have done is we took 226 of our managers um, through this particular program, the Coaching for Managers in Workplace Mental Health. These managers came from different sectors. They came from pharma, they came from tech, they came from insurance and uh, finance. And what we did initially was we met with the stakeholders to be able to review some of the pain points across each of these businesses. And for some of our clients, we reviewed their mental health policy. We were able to give some recommendations, but we were able to develop practice case scenarios. So there, the managers were able to say, and the HR were able to share, what were the pain points specific to their business? So for one of our clients, it was very much around addiction. So we were able to bring that into our program. For another client, it was around hybrid working and some of the challenges around bringing people back into the office. Um, so what we did here was we delivered our training to our managers. We done a pre and we done a post measurement. So post, we found that there was an increase of 45%. So an improvement um, in the manager's ability to communicate their concerns to an employee that was struggling with a mental health issue. There was a 45% improvement in managers being able to de-escalate a crisis when supporting employees. There was a 35% improvement in managers being able to recognize the signs of potential mental health issues and 100% had reported improved confidence and competency post the assessment. For some of these managers, they went on to complete the second level of this program and to get a certificate in coaching in workplace mental health. So again, just a really nice program and this slide just demonstrates that it was measurable and it was effective. And I think we move on. You could have to unmute yourself, Marina. Oh, thank you, Enda. I could have gone long without <laughs> myself. Sorry there. It's always better second time around, anyway. <laughs> thank you. So, um, thanks, Michelle. I was just saying that, um, yeah, health and well-being comes from from the top, obviously, with all these good policies and programs, but also with empowering this middle management to do so in their team and implement these programs within their teams. And also, thank you for the reminders that um, there's always more to be done in health and well-being at work. And as leaders and managers, we all have this responsibility um, towards health and well-being for, for our own teams. So um, so thank you very much. And we'll be sharing the slides and the recording um, by email of this webinar. And in the ch uh, chat and Q&A, please feel free to ask your questions for, for Michelle. I can see a great question already from Claire in the, in the Q&A there and some anonymous questions as well. So please um, send that in the chat and Q&A for the Q&A time at the end. And today we're also joined by um, Enda. Thanks, Enda. And so following an early career working with athletes, um, elite athletes on performance psychology and biomechanics, uh, you moved into um, workplace health promotion and academia. You worked on multiple research initiatives um, within the workplace health promotion and you sit in the Association Health Promotion CIPD and executive committees. You worked in NGO, public and private sector um, organization to bring evidence-based intervention to reality. And you currently work at Irish Life as a strategic well-being consultant. And you also work with Cisco, who are today in the call. So hi, Enda, thanks for joining and how are you? Thank you very much. Thanks for the intro. Great. So just before we um, go into the link between well-being performance, the future of health at work and all that, we'll launch a quick poll just to know, because we're interested to see if um, in the audience um, you have a health and well-being program already in place in your organization. And that's going to be a great link to our Q&A time with Enda. Good. So does your organization have a health and well-being program?
Good. A lot of responses there. I think we can close now and share results. Good. So we have 44% saying yes, um, but it needs improvement. Also 27% in the call not having a well-being program yet. So, and uh, for these organizations just um, starting to promote health and well-being um, in the workplace, where should they start? Yeah, it's a common question. Um, and I think the definition of a program can be quite daunting for some companies, depending on their size and the amount of resources they have. The, the most important thing really is to start with um, some data. So that can be very sophisticated or it can be quite basic. Um, and really the, the data of what you're looking at is trying to pull together um, what is available to you. So for example, um, Michelle mentioned some of those at the start, um, things like our health insurance claims, um, uh, the income protection claims, why are people off sick? Um, some of the employee um, voice surveys, kind of a lot of companies will run annual surveys. Um, can you piggyback on top of that? Or can you um, take some of the insights from those? Um, maybe you'll do some primary research. So like our Health of the Nation uh, survey that we run every year, provides really valuable insights as well to see um, where the country as a whole is going and, and that'll inform our program design. So really what you want to do is um, see what's available to you first. And if not, you can also um, do your own primary research. And again, it doesn't have to be too complicated, but it's about making informed decisions a lot of people make the mistake of jumping straight in and um, seeing what is being done elsewhere and trying to um, fit that into their own organization. And really, it's not always a case of um, just copying others. And um, sometimes it works, but sometimes it doesn't. We a couple of years ago, we developed it. We were trying to figure out what the, the most effective programs were and, and trying to help clients along that way. Um, and this is kind of where some of the links with, with Cisco are. So. We developed um, a well-being assessment for companies, um, and we 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 did this. It was a, a two-way communication, um, an open-ended uh, interview style, and we um, we actually have a, a little slide on that as well. Actually, so um, the well-being assessment really what it did was it assessed the most um, effective areas um, and the difference between um, a well-being program that's really successful versus one that maybe isn't so successful. So we were trying to, we we're scratching our heads wondering why some companies were, um, you know, they're really successful in doing what they're doing. We'd take the same intervention and and run it elsewhere and maybe it wouldn't have the same impact. And really what it is, is it's based on um, five kind of key areas. Um, and what we do is we go through all those areas and um, it's a self-assessment, um, which is scored as well. So it's a scoring system and it's based on things like leadership, um, you know, so is your leadership really bought in? Is it integrated? Um, have you done good planning? Are, are you well organized? Um, have you got funding, for example, or not? Um, what's your, you know, how well have you implemented the programs that you've done? So it can be, you know, what's the, good, what's the right timing for it? What's the right day of the week? Um, what's the right mode? Um, and then it's looking at, um, do you evaluate and review what you're doing as well? So they're quite, um, I suppose, fundamental questions to be asking. And it was interesting to see the different scores across the board. Um, again, these are self-assessed um, and we pr pr produce a report with that as well. But it's a really nice starting point for the organization to really see what they're at. Um, I'm sorry, where they're at. Um, and really, the, 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 there's a lot of structural work that goes on in the background longer term to make sure there's executive sponsorship, for example, making sure that there's time carved out. And, you know, luckily, a company like Cisco, like scored very well in this area, you know, they, they have a, quite a good structure in place. And um, it was a good, I suppose it, it showed us that um, the assessment that we that we ran um, a little audit at the time, uh, that it was it was worthwhile doing that and, and the companies that are doing well scored quite well in it which which kind of validated what we were what we were discussing um as well but what i would say the, the main point is that it gets people to think a little bit differently um to take a step back and see you know do we need to do a little bit more work in the background to um you know the structures do we have the right people in place ambassadors and those types of things so i'd say that's um you know a long-winded answer of where where to start really is is figuring out um, try and get as much data available to you um, and, and, and really sit there with an open mind and let that guide you as opposed to um, uh, your own ideas.
Very good. And we have a lot of HR people in this call really ready to do all of this. And they also need to convince, you know, the leadership to to buy in that. So how would you think um, focusing on employee uh, health and well-being can positively impact business performance? Yeah, so the like the return on investment, I suppose it's, it's always a question that we get asked and it's a difficult one um, to to answer very succinctly. Individual programs will always have um, different kind of results and different percentage returns on investment. But I think the simplest way is to, to understand that the um, organizations, again, have scored well in our assessment um, and that, that have really well-rounded and uh, meaningful programs, their companies tend to perform better. Um, and that's at a simple level. So there's an interesting um, study done a couple of years ago. Um, again, we have a little graph on that as well to, to help explain that. But basically, um, anybody who's interested in, um, in in kind of stocks and shares, they'll know what's called the S&P 500, so the top 500 companies um, in the world. And then what it'll show is the um, they grouped all of those together. So that's the blue line on the graph there. So the, the, it's the financial performance of those companies um, across a 14 year period. Then in the green line, what um, there is, there's an award in, in America called the um, Everett C. Coop Award. Um, and what that is, is a bit like a great place to work, um, you know, companies that have uh, done really well have a really strong program in place and they grouped all those companies together over the years and what they found was the companies with strong well-being programs outperformed their growth and their financial performance outperformed the top 500 companies in the world as well so if you're looking for an investment tip maybe that's one place to go and look at these companies that have really um strong uh, well-being programs so that's kind of at, a, at an aggregate level um quite, you know that's that's the strongest um kind of argument really to have a strong program in place and to get that there's there's also more specific kind of measurements and and you know costs to Ill, Ill health as well which is more straightforward it's more um, prescriptive and it's it's easier to kind of get down to the details of that um so what we did was a little calculation just um for a company so on the left hand side you'll see you know if you want to do a program like the one that michelle was describing but you want to get some buy-in there and you have to kind of um, talk to the people in finance and you have to talk to the leaders and, and how exactly will i get this program over the line so what you, what you have to look at there's three main costs in, in business um from from an employee's perspective there's absenteeism costs there is um presenteeism so like you know un, unproductive time we'll say um, and also turnover and, and and how this is related to mental health so we did some calculations um you know we can go into a lot more detail about that and how we came to that um but for a company of 400 employees the cost of mental ill health um, in those areas is roughly 500,000 um, a year. So the cost of kind of doing nothing uh, in a company that size is, is is quite significant. So by trying to improve those areas of absenteeism, you know, presenteeism and also um, into the turnover, perhaps those programs, you know, even if they're they're not going to maybe um, reduce all of that cost, but that straight away is, is, a, is a cost that's going out of the business. So it, that's a, an incentive to, to, to run the programs and hopefully have a positive impact. So that's kind of, there's a lots of different ways of, of assessing uh, return on investment and, and, you know, you've got kind of your general level, uh, but also more specifically um, in a topic as well. Wow. So that proves that it's working well. And we have actually similar numbers with trust, a uh, great place to work as well, that investing in your people is, is actually saving money for your for your overall business. And it's really linked to business performance as well. So it's really good to have numbers for, for people in the call today. So um, so thank you for that. And, uh, and do you have any example or policies or benefits that have proven to be particularly effective in supporting um, employee health and well-being at work? <laughs> So I think the, the the main thing in terms of programs is that the structures are there in place, um, and that's kind of the the, the groundwork for us. Um, luckily, in Irish life ourselves, actually we have a really strong program. Um, we've uh, we've some some great initiatives internally, so we like to practice what we preach. We've got a great team internally uh, doing that as well, and a lot of work of the last kind of year, a couple of years, has gone into setting up ambassadors and running trainings and making sure that you know it's a large organisation, um, but they you know there's a huge group of around 90 um, ambassadors actually in different parts of the business who themselves are taking ownership 
they're going through a process of of taking um the data that's available to them they're planning the programs they're running themselves they have some ownership and they're really bought into that as well um and there's executive leadership across the board so a lot of this work is a little bit unseen um until you get to that point where the structures are in place so i would say the basics are important having um you know depth within the organization where you can have a two-way communication um method of you know getting the information out there through ambassadors but also the feedback uh, as well to help guide the programs so i would say that's uh, one of those fundamental um, areas to, to work on um, and it's, it would help with sustainability as well of the program so it's not falling on one individual or a small team of, of people that it's really embedded across the whole organization okay very good and and last question um for for now um around future of workplace um health and well-being and how it's going to evolve in the future what should hr professional be preparing for um, I think what we're seeing, so we have a, we work with a lot of Irish Life Health clients and um, a corporate business clients as well. So we have um, a large corporate book there where we work with primarily, but also directly as well. And what we're seeing the change in the last kind of two to three years is that we're moving away from um, having a, a wide range of activity. And um, that's once off, that's kind of, you know, a seminar here, information there, because there was a big rush, especially during COVID, just to kind of cover topics um, and try to appeal to lots of different audiences. But the, especially with moving stuff online, the whole world, as you know, different people dialing in from different parts of the, of the world as well today, you have to compete against that. So what it's important is that it's not focusing just on information, but actually there's a move towards more programmatic style of interventions um, or um, that there's a start, a middle and an end uh, to that as well. Um, a lot of the manager programs are really effective because they have a, a huge impact on teams and individuals, um, but also the structure of that where we're improving skills, not just knowledge, um, is, is a uh, is, is probably the biggest trend in the area. And I think that'll uh, continue to go to go on as well. There's so much, there's not much airspace for a lot of programs and, and different teams and different um, times of the year. So it's important that we're focused more on one or two main priorities. Um, and we are really effective in that as opposed to do it, trying to cover everything and doing it less effectively. Very good. Thank you very much. And then we have some questions in Q&A that we will uh, take at the at the very end of, of this session. So thank you. That's interesting to see the impact of health and well-being at work on the workforce, but also on the business performance um, overall, and that we, you can start with low budget, quick wins. Um, so we'll be sharing all these slides and recording by email to everyone after the session and in the chat and Q&A, um, keep asking your questions for Michelle and uh, on to our next speaker, who is Audrey. Um, so Audrey is Employee Engagement Manager at Cisco. Um, Audrey joined Cisco in 2021 as the Engagement Leader, People, Culture and Operations uh, and based in Galway. As a seasoned international HR and engagement leader, she has an extensive experience building but sustaining technology-driven sites, leveraging strong employee base and engendering co company culture. She also has a passion for putting and the employee experience at the center of everything she does, and she believes people are at the heart of an organization. Hi, Audrey. Thank you for joining. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. And that's a lovely opening question. I'm doing good. <laughs> Great. So um, can you share with us Cisco's experience and journey towards developing that well-being and health approach, your strategy in Ireland and, and globally? Sure, great. And I think maybe just I'll start with, you know, Cisco overall and, and our size of, of our organization. So Cisco is a US tech multinational and we're in the space of networking, security, collaboration, products and services. So globally, we have approximately 83,000 employees. So it's a very large organization. Um, we have about 360 offices globally, and that would be that would be the size of the organization across actually even in 80 countries. Um, so here in Ireland, we have an employee base of around 400. As I said, I'm based in our Galway site and we have a Dublin site. So our Galway um, teams are focusing on our WebEx engineering and then our Dublin office is very much sales. Um, so that's kind of an overview of, of Cisco, but we're very much a hybrid environment. And so it's all about flexibility and choice for our leaders and employees. So um, our teams can choose uh, remote first, office first, 
are the hybrid. And um, what our 83,000 employees are very clear on is actually our overall purpose. And our overall purpose for Cisco is to power an inclusive future for all. So that really blends in nicely into the topic today about you know fostering um, a culture of well-being and health. And yeah, so I think I have, we'll move to the next slide. I promise I won't have too many slides so that we can leave time for, for the Q&A. Um, so I wanted today just to kind of give you an overall view of our approach to well-being. And it's very much a holistic approach. And you heard from Marina at the start of the conversation um, that I, I love putting people at the at the center of what we do. And that's exactly what, what Cisco's ethos is. Um, they want us all to be at our best. So you can he see here on the slide in the center, it's all about the individual. So we have four pillars in our um, well-being strategy. And the first would be physical, then emotional, social and financial, not in any order, but a lot of companies here today would probably have similar pillars. And what we like to do in Cisco is, um, you know, have, a de have, have all the basics and then see, can we keep adding on each year and, and working through those? So example for physical, we work with Irish Life really closely on, you know, kind of a lot of challenges and having a really good um, health and benefits package for our employees. Um, but then what can we do on top of that? You know, we have a gym on site, we've access um, that employees can go online to do yoga. And then I'll talk later on um, a, a well-being partner that we partner with. Um, emotional um, well-being for all of us is really important. So we have access to our EAP, again, through Irish Life and a global a global program. And even this week, um, it's our global mental health awareness week. And we actually, we, we do it for the week so that we build that awareness. So when people do really need that help, they're aware of it. But of course, we look after emotional throughout the year, throughout the year. So this week is our, our global health and wellness globally for Cisco. Um, social, as 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 Inda and Michelle talked about earlier, it's really important now with all the companies going through such amount of change that we all have that connection. So in Cisco, what do we do to connect people socially um, and into you know that that world of collaboration? So we do a lot in this space, and I'm going to talk about our inclusive communities in a minute that really feeds into the social well-being of our employees and as well you know with, with this hybrid environment and then financial well-being um so again in the last number of years this this is top of mind for a lot of employees and i, re I read on the the workforce institute that um 44 percent actually of employees are anxious globally of their financial well-being so we partner with nudge a company um a global company that does a lot of financial advice and gives that extra ex extra I suppose support for people here and we often run webinars and as well through Irish Life. So they're the, the basic four pillars that we would work from strategically. And then you can see the ripple from our leaders and teams. It's really important. And, and Michelle actually spoke a lot about people, leaders and the importance of I them getting support from the company. So making sure we we would have quarter quarterly um, training programs for our leaders that discuss all top of mind subjects and well-being is, is definitely top of mind and how we can support our leaders and how they can support our employees. And so that they they live our principles and values and like with the great place to work that it's a trust environment. So our leaders are really key to the success um, of our well-being strategy. Um, we call our culture a uh, conscious culture here in Cisco, and we have such buy-in from our leader, executive leadership on culture in the organization. And in basic terms, what we mean by you know conscious culture is that we want to make it an inclusive environment for everybody that we belong, but that it's a positive environment. And so um, that's across the company or employees, but externally to our customers as well, that they have a positive experience. And then finally, in the outer ring, it's our community. So we, we believe in giving back and giving back to our external community and how that kind of feeds into our well-being strategy and as well it's like being partnered with you Marina and the great place to work the feedback and analysis that we get from from joining a great place to work around our well-being strategy is really important as well so that's our overall um, holistic approach to well-being and as we're a global company we do actually have a head of global well-being who is on the executive leadership team so that's how much 
our executive leadership buys into the well-being of our employees. Um, so that's the overview. So um, I have a second slide that I can um, talk up into. So it's about how we show up in Cisco for supporting mental health and well-being for our employees. So um, on the first, the first picture there, you can see um, authentic leadership. So again, for for any program, I suppose tr throughout a company, it's all about get, like leadership buy-in and you know really meaningful and that they mean um, they they you know that well-being is at the centre of what we do and our people. So. Um, we would have executive leadership, we would have about every six weeks, um, a global all hands where um, we discuss business strategy, what's top of mind, but there's always an element of well-being and how we're doing as as teams. And we would feed and we would do this locally as well. So it mirrors what we're doing globally. And then local leadership would um, hold regular open communication so that all our employees can, can feed into that. And you might wonder why um, there's a, a little baby in the picture. So Chuck, um, Robbins is our CEO and this is his granddaughter so it just shows how authentic executive leadership are so this was during an all hands um, his little granddaughter came in and he 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 kept the granddaughter on on the call for for the for the hour so it was great to see that that kind of in reality and that they they are all like us um, so the second point is our benefits and support and you've heard from Enda in Irish Life you know great health care for employees and pension and a, a lot of support um, but I suppose one benefit that I'd like to highlight and it, it shows about our well-being is this critical time off. Um, so with with well-being and employees, um, we're a lot of our employees are at different stages of their lives and we're all going to go through an emergency at some stage. And so this is there exactly to support our well-being um, through those times. So for exactly example, for a bereavement, um, we don't we don't put in our policy, um, you know, it's three days if somebody dies or anything like this. This critical health, this critical time off policy is about taking enough time for you to grieve and um, your manager will be very supportive of that. So it's an extra critical time off where you get paid and you work with your leadership so uh, again it's supporting well-being for all um the third picture is um a support days so i actually read in the the workplace institute that um 89 of leaders don't actually take their allotted vacation days and it's something like 82 83 percent for employees so for wellness we well-being we do need our employees to be taking those times time off so again our leadership do encourage all of us to take our vacation days but what they started introducing in the last number of years which has been really really successful is um we call them days for me so that's where the whole company 83,000 people um take the day off the company shuts down and um we all go do something that we enjoy take time off away from from our work schedules and come back the next day so um this year we've got four extra days for me this is fully paid for by the company but just shows how um, Cisco and our leadership listen so when we introduced these first they were spontaneous days and we got feedback from our employees to say um, they'd actually like to know so that they could plan the days a bit better so the leadership listened and now we we get the days at the start of the year and they're always tagged on to a weekend so it gives people an extra break and we find these really really um, our feedback and data from from these for me are huge hugely positive. Um, we also encourage our employees to volunteer to our, I mentioned the community. So for us, giving back to the community globally and locally is, is key to our success. Um, and so each employee in Cisco gets uh, 10 volunteer days per year um, where they can volunteer um, for charities or anything that they're passionate about. Again, these are paid days. And for example, in, in Galway, we've a lot of GA supporters and, you know, um, they can go, uh, some you know, kind of be a coach for a GA a team. And this is giving back. We also do a lot for STEM education. So again, it's all these volunteering days feed into to well-being, um, we find as well. And in addition, we get our birthday day off. So some great supports just for that extra well-being. Um, then the safe to talk. So this is a, around mental health and well-being. And so, um, as you said in, in the beginning, um, Inda Michelle, it's really important that you know the 
employees have a trust environment and that it's open. So we um, have a safe, safe to talk space. So through Webex, we've spaces and this is a peer to peer space where people can talk openly about how they're feeling. And it's very much an encouraging space. Um, it is monitored by our um, ER team as well, just just in case there's anything that needs extra support. But we would provide a lot of resources as well in our SharePoint about where to go. And um, we do lots of you know, different webinars and seminars throughout the year um, to support people um, around all of our mental health and the manager's role modeling is is key um, I know we spoke a lot about the people leader and managers um, especially in a hybrid world now um, there's more of a focus on um, people managers and role model role modeling um, so for example um, just from a local perspective, actually, here in Ireland, so we 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 would have our all hands regularly, and one of the leaders um, spoke about burnout, and you know he was very open, very honest about it, and that actually led to a lot of conversation around um, burnout and people recognizing the signs, and um, so then as a local, you know, Ireland site, we were able to work with Irish Life then to kind of put in places maybe some extra talks on burnout. So um, that was an example of, of our managers being role models and not being afraid to be vulnerable and open to, to all of us. Um, and then finally, just to talk about our holistic um, well-being. So as, a, as Enda mentioned in Irish Life, we would work with um, Enda regularly on, in Ireland on what strategy we want for the next few months. Every quarter, we align with our global well-being. So to make sure that um, we have a lot of support here locally. And we partner with um, a company then called Pavelka. It's a workplace organization for well-being. And their focus again is on connecting people through well-being, and um, they do a lot of extra that people can dip in and dip out of. So, like healthy eating habits, um, a lot of ch work challenges as well. So we find those extra, um, I suppose, challenges, extra programs that we can give our employees that we find this, you know, really good for our, for our well-being. Um, so that's a, a whistle stop into how we show up for, for our employees here. Very good. Very good, Audrey. I'm just about to apply at Cisco now. It's wonderful that everything <laughs> that you do. And um, just one question around, you do a lot about initiatives and programs. How do you make sure you have the employee buy-in and they're engaged with, with what you, you can offer? Yeah, it, it, that's a great question. And being a global organization of that size, you know, how do we get buy in for for such a such a global organization and local? So, again, it's all about, um, you know, leadership buy in at first, you know, so we're very intentional about what we do. So with the leader leader buy in, you know, they promote what, what needs to be promoted. We'll work intentionally on what programs. And um, so that's really successful for us. But it also actually leads into to this slide. Um, and this is where we're seeing the biggest buy-in, um, especially in this hybrid world where, you know, a lot of our employees are working from home or they're working from the office or, you know, kind of, as I said, in the hybrid. So how do we get our employees to be even more connected and feeling like they belong and having buy-in to our strategies? So, um, our inclusive communities in lots of companies, these are, um, employee resource groups. So, um, we have we have about I think it's about thirty globally um, different groups that we um, we would have have um, inclusive communities set up for. So these are just an example, and um, we're finding a lot of connection through through having an inclusive community. And each of these inclu inclusive communities would have an executive leader um, buy in as well as an ally, which which again reinforces that kind of leader um, leadership you know buy in into that space. So I'm going to actually just pick maybe the emerging talent group here because this is a really successful inclusive community globally but also locally here um, and so when we have new employees that you know start and especially in, in, in hybrid now you know after they've been onboarded, how how can they meet peers? How can they get more connected? Um, so this is an emerging talent group where they also have pillars, and um, they would their 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 main aim would be to connect, um, educate, give back, and be the brand for Cisco. So um, our emerging talent group are 
it's for earlier in careers and so that they can work on their personal and professional um, well-being and they would organize self-organize a lot of a lot of meetups um, example last week they just got together to play some some board games so again it's just reinforcing that connection but the power of having a group focused on connecting that cohort of employees and their well-being um, is key and then we can actually then tailor um, what we do locally and what needs they need so that we can um, even further enhance our, our well-being. Um, again, Women of Cisco Group, um, it's another really powerful group that do a lot of initiatives and very much about uniting and inspiring. And as I said, a lot uh, all our all our inclusive communities have a local sponsor as well if we're here. So again, we have a lot of allies and um um, and just for mindfulness today, the um, well-being topic, mindfulness and resilience network. Again, it's another global network where we can feed into and we get lots of tips, lots of sessions, lots of talks from experts. So again, a lot of knowledge and information we can, you know, um, take on board. And I suppose for, for, for Ireland as well, our corporate social responsibility is another group that really promotes well-being and getting involved in external charities. And um, so it's a group that we organize volunteering for, for our internal employees so they can go out to our external community. And again, it's just another way for our teams to connect in a meaningful way. So that would be our inclusive communities. And I suppose we would see this as a really, really strong connection into our wellbeing strategy. Very good. And I believe you're part um, of th some of these groups as well and communities yourself. So that's a good demonstration and how leaders actually promote that uh, even internally. Thanks, Audrey. Absolutely. And I, I can move to the next slide. Um, so I know Enda and Michelle have, have gone through a lot of data, um, so I'll just keep this brief, but we, we globally, um, as we have, as I said, I think I mentioned, we have a global head of um, sustainability. So each we used to do a survey every quarter and now we're going to go back to yearly around our well-being. So um, we have found from that study, we, we break it into two two areas. So personal well-being is how I'm doing and then the social well-being is how we're doing as a company. So it's a really good tool to, to really assess and see how we're doing and what we need to focus on next. Um, and as I as, as I kind of mentioned, everybody's at different stages in, in their journey, whether personal or work. Um, so it's really important for us to, to keep reviewing um, how we're doing as a company, how we're supporting our employees. And as Inda said in Irish Life, you know, doing that assessment really helps us to tailor for global and local. And what we have found in, in, these, um, in this survey, our employees, you know, rate one to five. And those that rate highest in their own feeling that they're positive about their own well-being um, have demonstrated that they're more fully engaged and that they feel really positive about their Cisco experience and um, they would check in with their leaders a lot more so it's just really positive um, experience when when they buy when we do a survey and they can you know kind of we can see this feedback and what what has come out of it really is um, especially in the last year or two um, where we've seen groups that may need the most help is our caregivers. Um, so we have a lot of employees that would have extra caregiving um, responsibilities. And so we looked at that and how can we help um, our people in this cohort? And so we looked at this um, locally and globally, and we have now put in a place a program um, which is called Wealthy and that supports a kind of a concierge and helps people in the caregiving. So it's an extra step. And then we've covered people leaders um, a lot today. And again, this is a group that, um, you know, our role modeling are, are, have gone through a lot of change in the last number of years. So um, again, this is a group that we are focusing on. And we, as I said, um, our leaders get quarterly training on a lot of our, our well-being and different topics that are top of mind and strategy. And I know Marina, in this and our feedback, the great place to work survey each year is a great data point for us. Um, and I know we've been in great place to work for a number of years. And from 2017 to 2022-23, um, our well being scored by our employees now is is over 90%. So that's, you know, kind of we've heard from our employees, they they feel, you know, they we're we're doing right by our well being. So it's great to have a great place to work to get that data point from. 
Exactly. And um, and as you said, it's great to be able to measure that as well. So well-being is, is one of the 17 categories we measure with the with a trust index survey at Great Place to Work. So as you said, 86 to 90 percent in, in a few years. That's that's amazing to be in the 90s. Congratulations to Cisco. So thank you very much, Audrey. And, and I know, Cisco, you do a lot. You're so inspiring in, in what you do for your health and well-being at work. And for the audience, a reminder as well that um, you can start with doing the basics really well, listening to your people, communicating, involving them in these programs and implementing the quick wins. Um, so we'll be sharing the slides and recording by email to everyone after this call. And now I invite Michelle, Enda and Audrey to come back for the five last minutes and take some questions uh, from the audience. So we have some questions in the Q&A and I'll start with you, Michelle, um, with a question from Claire Walsh uh, asking, what is your view when um, the format structure of the performance process in an organization is the trigger for the negative negatively impacting an employee mental health? Yeah, I think with that, the first thing I probably would like to understand is how how so. Um, so for that employee, what is it about the performance process that is actually negatively impacting? Is it the frequency of meetings? Is it the person facilitating the meeting? Just to kind of crystallize and break down which part they're finding difficult. Because then we have something tangible. What we find is sometimes we're kind of, it's too vague, it's too high level. So by taking that information back um, and then going back to discuss that as a business, and it might be seeking support from health and safety, employee relations, if we need to on a case-by-case -case basis to understand and get some, some direction. Um, but if they agree that there's something that needs to be changed, that's where you look at the reasonable accommodation measures and you want to build in the psychological safety piece and it might be, you know, spreading it out, and so it's less frequent. But putting some of those flexibility pieces in will be important. And um, because with mental health, we're trying to balance out the accommodation measures, making sure a person is feeling safe alongside the performance piece. So that would be my, my take is to understand, do a deeper dive, and then uh, suggest that. But that's escalated. Now you're looking at what flexibility can be built in, but getting the collaboration from the person who's going through the process so that they're brought in, invested, and they're also going to be driving uh, this plan. Very good. Thanks, Michelle. Um, we have another question from Gillian here in the Q&A asking um, how to measure presenteeism. That, um, that's for, for you, Anda, you talked about the calculation you have there at Irish Life. So do you have a tool for that? How do you measure that presenteeism in organizations? Uh, so presenteeism is a difficult one to, to uh, measure, to be honest. Um, but I think the, I suppose the simplest way, depending on the business, the simplest way to, to, to measure it is um, your ability to perform your role um, and how that can impact um, your uh, I suppose your time or your kind of your feelings of stress or, or those types of things so if it's um if there's a way of measuring your output in any way um you know so the number of uh, you know for some sales people that's easy for other things in manufacturing obviously that's easy too but um some things it's maybe more about getting your job done and um, do you have to work late very often do you have to um you know rely do you miss a lot of deadlines um i think the the general concept is probably more important than the specifics of it um and and getting the the measure on the presentism is uh, notoriously difficult to do that but i think having um understanding just the impact in general to your working life um and to your job performance in general you know are, are your is your performance rating in your review um gone has that improved year on year for example and um, so that would be the types of things um to, to look out for in terms of your outputs as an individual and also as a team very good Thank you for that. And we have a question for, for you, Audrey, around um, the Cisco approach to, you know, that personal and social uh, well-being balance. And that's a question from Paul there. Um, and he would like to know um, how that works and how it's communicated internally. Yeah, that's that's a great question. So um, it's it it's really about our leadership as well, you know, kind of buying in that the importance of the personal and social aspect. Um, and so whatever we plan to do, that it's intentional and it's meaningful, you know, so that when we plan something that it's not going against, you know, kind of maybe what a, a you know, a business, um, a business requirement at the time. So it's, it's all about really planning it intentional and, um, you know, the social impact that like the, the leadership actually go to these social events as well, if we're holding, 
for example, social events, like if we have a summer event that our leaders will will act, will go and be involved. Um, and yeah, so the social, so everything we do in Cisco, if, if, if it's a meeting and it's meaningful, um, through WebEx, we, we have everybody remote join as well. So everybody's included. So anytime we do something social, the invite goes to all. Um, and then there's a complete choice whether people show up. But the social aspect, it's something that we, we continuously focus on. Um, and it's just really powerful getting people together, even if it's just a coffee morning or, um, but always tie it in with something meaningful to get maybe more people into the office if you want them to, to connect. Very good. Thanks, Audrey. And um, I'm conscious of the time here. We have more questions coming in in the Q&A that we can't take today. But Michelle and then Audrey's um, LinkedIn profile will be linked in the follow up email. So if you want to connect with them, feel free to ask um, any more questions that you have. And thank you for joining today. And we know that promoting health and well-being at work is, is not easy. And we need to work on that every year as leaders and managers. And we must listen to our people, involve them in the process to make sure we have high trust level in our workplace culture a healthy workforce and also really well performing businesses so thank you very much uh, for joining today i hope you enjoyed this webinar and have a great rest of the day thank you um to michelle anda and audrey bye everyone <laughs>